So good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Jarmo Aikren. I'm the head of the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Helsinki. And um, as the assigned moderator for today, um, I have the pleasant duty to welcome you all to this uh, webinar jointly organized by the Finnish Institute for International Affairs, the Trans-European Policy Studies Association, TEPSA, and uh, the Parliament's office here in here in Finland. Um, the topic of the day is debating the future of Europe towards meaning, meaningful EU criticism. And, um, and I'm, I'm extremely happy that, that we have such a broad audience for this event today. And I think that's a reflection of the of the time that that we are living through at the moment. We had a very eventful campaign for the European elections last year, um, the, the creation of the new commission uh, and the uh, creation of the new program for the for this legislature and for the commission. And this year has been marked by the uh, the uh, um, unfortunate event of the COVID crisis through which the European institutions and the member states have been being forced to travel through. And we are in the middle of a very momentous decisions about the the, uh, the the budget and the rule of law mechanism, etc., including many other obviously important political processes. And here in Finland, uh, the government has launched um, initiative to uh, to have a major consultation paper created on on Finland's EU policy. So we have gathered here um, at at a very interesting time. Um, I also have the have the pleasure of uh, of introducing our distinguished speakers and panelists today. Um, I won't go through the uh, the whole CV of of our speakers. It's very lengthy and, and distinguished. But I will I will introduce very quickly. Otmar Karas um, is a very seasoned Austrian um, member of the European People's Party in uh, in the uh, European Parliament. He has been. Uh, in the parliament beginning in the, in the 1990s has been is currently serving his second term as the vice president of of the european parliament has held many other important uh, positions uh, both in the parliament institutionally as well as in in his political group Hedi Hautala is well known to all of us here in finland has a distinguished career as a politician in in, in finland before joining the european parliament in the 1990s has been both in the national politics and, and in the European politics uh, ever since, and is currently serving as the European uh, the Vice President for the European Parliament, representing the Green Group. And then we have Mia Petrokumpula Natri, um, who also had a very long career in, in Finnish politics, including serving in the National Parliament as a chair of the European Affairs Grand Committee. Uh, and is now serving as a, in the second term of uh, in in the European Parliament, and is currently vice chair of the newly established uh, special committee on artificial intelligence, as well as vice chair of the of the standing delegation for Parliament's relations with the United States. Um, and then, as experts um, who have uh, been contributing to the TEPSA book on Euroscepticism, which is the basis. Of, of today's discussions, we have Professor Michal Kading, who is the Jean Monet Professor for Political Science at the University of Duisburg, and uh, has held uh, several positions, uh, including Chairman of TEPSA beforehand. And then from Finland, we have Juha Jokela, who uh, is well known to all of us here in Helsinki as the Program Director for European Union program in the Finnish Institute for International Affairs. Um, my role is, is here just to lightly moderate the discussion. Um, the, uh, the running order of the day is fairly straightforward. Uh, we will start with uh, slightly longer introductory opening remarks by the two experts and authors of the book, um, Michal Kering and Juha Jokela. Um, and I also wish to, at this point, also thank both uh, Michal and Juha for excellent cooperation in, in organizing this event. And then following these, these opening remarks, we turn to the, uh, to the members of the, of the parliament 
for opening rounds of comments, and we, we move on from there to discussion. And, uh, and during the discussion, um, it is possible already during these opening remarks, it's possible for all of you participants of the event to, to write questions um, to the chat um, dimension of, of the Teams platform, and, and I will try to pick up them at pertinent times to feed in to the discussion. So we hope to hope to also include as many questions to you participants as it is possible during during this uh, this event. We will start from the state of play, and then we try to slowly move forward to discussing about the what what's in store in terms of the future and and how could we move towards a more meaningful EU debate in Finland as well as in in Europe in in general. Um, as technical remarks, I would just simply repeat that, that we have a fairly large group of people here. There might even be more joining us later. So uh, just in order to ensure technical stability of the, of the platform, I would ask all of you participants who are not speakers to turn off your, your cameras uh, so that, uh, that we will always see the, uh, the camera view of the speakers and panelists. And, uh, and and the, the platform stays as technically stable as possible. I have with me here uh, uh, dealing with the with the technical problems if they should occur, as well as we have colleagues in the Finnish Institute of International Affairs doing the same thing. So I, I thank them also for for the organization uh, up until this point. And hopefully we will get through this uh, without any any uh, technical issues. Um, but without any any further ado, um, I would. Um, call on on Professor Michal Kading um, to start off with uh, with a presentation, uh, and uh, and and Michal, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind words and uh, the kind introduction. And uh, well, it's an honor to start this panel discussion. Um, thank you for giving me the floor and to give me the opportunity to basically um, help you to understand a little bit of what have been working together with FIA as member of TEPSA, the very successful network bringing together more than 40 universities and think tanks um, uh, across Europe. But basically, Ms. Pollack, Paul Schmidt uh, from Vienna, together with me, we have been editing over the last couple of years a series on the future of Europe debates. Because probably the first point I would like to make in this regard talking about the meaningful uh, criticism of the European Union is that we first of all probably have to appreciate the, the sheer diversity of criticism that we find in Brussels, but more importantly, out there in our countries, in our beautiful countries all over the European Union. It's a landscape of different forms of criticism and not all criticism is per se taboo or should be taboo, or should be basically uh, labeled as Euroscepticism. I think this is very important to state from the very early beginning that we all do very well in embracing the idea of criticizing uh, constructively the European Union and the European integration process from the beginning. And also when looking into the future, I think that's a very important point to make at the very early beginning before we risk ending up um, basically blaming every sort and form of criticism as per se Eurosceptic. That's not the case. Uh, that would go much too short. And this is exactly what this book is all about. It brings in uh, very short opinionated pieces, a very nice uh, overview of each and every single EU country um, inside the European Union, but also outside the European Union, because obviously uh, also in Switzerland, also in Norway and or in Turkey, there are debates about the future of Europe um, of a different kind, but they are obviously also quite Im important um, for us if we want to together bring the European Union integration process uh, together. So allow me to maybe, uh, next to this uh, very basic introductory note, to maybe highlight one or two additional aspects. 
because the moment we start talking about Euroscepticism, hence a form of criticism combined with populist um, notions specifically, uh, and most importantly, um, I think what is very important to understand is that there is a lot of, uh, that we find Euroscepticism Thing, and chapters show this very nicely, only on the right political spectrum. We do find actually very different forms of Euroscepticism also on the left side of the uh, political spectrum. There are exceptions to the rules, uh, right? In Austria, in Cyprus, in Denmark, Estonia, Hungary, Poland and Slovakia, criticism is to be found, Euroscepticism is to be found exclusively on the right political uh, spectrum, but in all the other countries we see uh, a combination of left and right Euroscepticism pretty much um, uh, evolving. And Euroscepticism is there to stay. I think this is also something to understood from the very early beginning. It has always been around. Since we start talking about European integration, we do have forms of Euroscepticism even in the founding EU member states. So it is not only a problem uh, of countries that joined later the European Union. No, not at all. We have forms of Euroscepticism from the very early beginning um, from the very early beginning uh, of European integration. So it is definitely not a recent phenomena, but it is, is, it is a part, if you want, uh, it is part of European integration as such, and it is there to stay. This is, I think, also, and this is why we do have this panel, because we want to talk about meaningful these different forms of Euroscepticism in light of the future of Europe. Um, Euroscepticism on top of is also, if you want, a standalone um, cleavage cutting through the left-right right, uh, right divide. You can see this very nicely inside the European Parliament, right, where you could group the political uh, parties according to this left-right dimension. But Euroscepticism clearly is also a cleavage inside the European Parliament, but also quite uh, predominantly in some national parliaments. I will come back to this maybe right away. Take the Netherlands, for example. Here you will see that simply the sheer number of parties that are inside the Tweede Kamer, this, uh, the, the, the Dutch parliament, shows you that there is not just one Eurosceptic party, but there is a whole diversity of Eurosceptic parties. You have Eurosceptic parties inside the Dutch parliament that really still want to leave uh, the European Union overhaul and talk explicitly about Nexit. But we also have other uh, out of these five rather Eurosceptic parties inside the Tweede Kamer that want to leave the Eurozone, so specific projects only of the European integration process. or. Um, or different forms um, 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 of, of, of Euroscepticism. So I think this is very much important to, to, uh, to be understood. And by reading these chapters, you will see this very nicely. Uh, it is a challenge in understanding these 27 and then beyond um, all those neighboring countries around the EU to understand the, the diversity of Euroscepticism but I think if we want to tackle the issue in a meaningful way, if we want to deal with Euro criticism and scepticism in a meaningful way, this is clearly something to be uh, clearly looking at as well. Because not in all countries, to let's face this uh, as well, not in all countries actually we have parties and forms of Euro scepticism. I think this is very often forgotten as well uh, with Ireland or Lithuania or Latvia, there is no Eurosceptic political party represented uh, in the national parliament or in municipalities. And um, in the European Parliament elections 2019, none of the uh, 30 political parties um, uh, in Latvia uh, supported actually leaving the European Union. So I think this is also something to be aware of. Um, uh, there is always a risk that we tend to look and focus at countries 
where there is an issue and where there is a problem. But let's not forget about those countries that might not actually have forms of Euroscepticism. And maybe we should ask, why do they not have forms of Euroscepticism? And to what extent that could actually help us um, to tackle the overall question of this panel? And maybe last but not least, and then I will leave it here. Um, and I think it's also important uh, to be understood from the very in, in, uh, beginning that Euroscepticism is in constant flux. Uh, it's a moving target and that makes it so extremely difficult. And these country chapters of our books show this very nicely. And if you look at the alternative for Germany, alternative for Deutschland in Germany, also the Fidesz party um, uh, in Hungary, you will see and appreciate the simple notion that these parties have changed over years. They have, they, they moved from being single topic parties uh, to parties with a fully fledged political agenda. At the beginning, uh, Fidesz, you might could have argued even being a rather, um, 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 well, definitely not as uh, positioning itself uh, um, 10, 20 years ago, the way it is representing itself uh, today. So I think this is the challenge and this is something um, that we have to be aware of and, and um, well, being a moving target uh, is probably something uh, that we will be uh, talking a lot about and I would leave it here for the time being and hand over to Juha to help us understanding how the current situation in Finland is because I didn't dare to say anything about Finland. That's Juha's job now. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. And, uh, and, and like Michal said, we turn now over to Program Director Dr. Juha Jokela from the Finnish Institute of uh, International Affairs. Juha, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jarmo. And thank you very much also, Michal, for your uh, introductory remarks. And also, my, on my behalf, thank you for our excellent panelists for your availability and participation. It's a great, great pleasure and honor to have you here on board with us on this time uh, when the EU's future is increasingly discussed and debated also here in Helsinki and more broadly in Finland. Uh, my task is to bring in a kind of a relatively small uh, member state and to aim to reflect a little bit uh, what this Finnish case broader European relevance might be in terms of the question we want to pose here today about the uh, meaningful EU criticism. So my focus is very much on the national level, but I think it has also uh, a broader European implications. And my key message uh, here today is that if the political parties uh, would like to move beyond Eurosceptic and populist framing of the EU affairs, uh, much more EU debate and also kind of a clarification clarifications, concrete clar clarifications of the party's EU positions in relation to the future of the EU is needed. Also during the kind of normal times, uh, I would say that that is a non-EU crisis times. And of course, we all know that when we look back the previous decade, then years, uh, argue that one can argue that uh, non-EU crisis years were more of an expect, except, exception. Uh, but I, I, I hope to make this point by looking into the years before the COVID-19 crisis pandemic and also, also the kind of the post-Brexit development with regard to the EU support among the citizens around uh, European Union. So given this relatively short time, I would like to talk about two issues here uh, in terms of the Finnish case. First, the Eurosceptic trends in Finland after the Brexit vote uh, 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 in the UK, and then the recent political debacle on the EU's economic uh, reco recovery package and the uh, uh, multi-annual financial uh, framework. So if we look at uh, if we look back a couple of years and the, the Eurosceptic political trends uh, here in Finland. I think many of us researchers have been somewhat puzzled with a paradox which relates to the Finnish political landscape. We have uh, uh, two conflicting uh, trends here, clearly. So on the one hand, the support for the EU has gone up uh, uh, quite significantly uh, during the past years. And at the same time, 
the openly populist and Eurosceptic uh, political party has scored uh, extremely well in the national uh, and also to some extent European elections. Uh, I think that the analysis which kind of try to explain the increasing support for the European Union Finland uh, suggests that uh, the Brexit was quite important uh, element here in Finland. I think the UK's departure actually made it evident that the EU membership cannot be taken for granted uh, and hence the citizens here in Finland might have felt a need to take a clearer position on EU matters either for or against the EU. But as we have seen in the polls it's been clearly uh, more for the EU. The support for the EU has been more than 70% uh, percent in the least recent Eurobarometers and for the Euro it's been uh, more than 80%. I think and uh, that moreover and despite Brexit the EU has also been uh, uh, muddling through some of the most significant existential crises that it have faced during the past uh, decade. Uh, that is, of course, the euro crisis and, uh, and the refugee crisis. And this might have also contributed to the, uh, the, the uh, uh, rise of EU support here in, in Finland. And I think very importantly for the Finns, uh, a more assertive Russia and also the increased military tensions in the Baltic Sea region and generally more conflictual uh, international landscape uh, has highlighted once again uh, the security policy benefits of the EU for the Finnish uh, citizens. And as this year has marked the 25th anniversary of Austrian, uh, Finnish and Swedish EU membership, uh, the many webinars that we have organized to, to in context of this uh, uh, anniversary uh, during this year have actually suggested that while the membership decision uh, in 95 was firstly and mostly an economic question for Austria and Sweden. Security perhaps was the key driver of the Finnish EU members, members, uh, membership and perhaps even a more important factor than economy. But as I mentioned, on the other hand, we have this highly, uh, when we have this highly supportive EU environment in Finland, we also have an openly populist and Eurosceptic party, the Finns party. And it has managed to consolidate its position as one of the major parties in the country uh, during the past 10 years. And I think it's quite in interesting also what happened in this country. In, in the it was included in the government in 2015. Uh, 15, and, and, and after this uh, inclusion in the government, the party's support uh, dramatically actually decreased. It was halved in a couple of months when it entered into the government. But, uh, and this, of course, then led uh, to some quite significant internal tensions in the party and finally to a party split. And the Finns party actually moved in the opposition again and rapidly managed to reposition itself. And in the 2019 parliamentary elections, it became the second largest party in the country. But inter interestingly, I would argue that its election campaign largely focused on immigration issues as well as climate policy, and it did it so within the domestic uh, uh, framework rather than in the European context or in the EU context. So one could argue that the Euroscepticism of the party was somehow uh, fading away, at least in its, in its uh, election uh, campaign. But if one looks at the election manifest of the party, it was clearly Eurosceptic. And some of us researchers also suggested that despite this high public support for the EU in Finland, Euroscepticism was not necessarily uh, withering away, but rather entering a kind of a latent phase uh, in the political uh, 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 landscape. Moreover, many of us also argued that it might actually make a quite forceful comeback when the next crisis uh, would hit the EU and bring some thorny EU questions, politically sensitive questions back on the national agenda. 
And this, I think, what we have seen during the during the past months, and especially during the last summer, when the COVID-19 crisis has hit the EU and the world, and also the national uh, national governments in many member states. In Finland, I would say that the thorniest EU matter related to the pandemic has been the EU's re uh, economic recovery package, and the uh, which was agreed uh, in the European Council in July. And I would say that the political debate over it is likely to in intensify uh, in the coming weeks again when this package goes through the Finnish Parliament. Uh, while the issue uh, and the debate uh, clearly would require, I would say, quite a significant uh, amount of further research, there are, so however, some uh, 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 preliminary observations that can be made already. First, I would suggest that the pro-European parties and the government were at least to some extent taken by surprise by the course of the events, and in particular, the nature of the Franco-German consensus on issuing EU debt and providing also grants, not only loans, for the member states in need. And, and this is, of course, the broader discussion and debate also related to the Eurozone crisis here in Finland about the joint fiscal responsibility in the EU context. Second, and I would say that given the sensitivities over this issue in Finland, uh, also in light of the Eurozone crisis and the emergence of Euroscepticism during the Eurozone crisis years, the Eurosceptic Finns party has uh, uh, has been again able to position itself as a credible art alternative towards these EU developments. Third, and, uh, uh, and relatedly, uh, the discussion here in Finland became uh, largely framed as a simple yes or no uh, EU question uh, in terms of the recovery package. And I think some of the key experts participating in this debate also noted that providing critical assessments and comments on the matter of the recovery package, uh, they were often uh, labeled or interpreted to be uh, Eurosceptic, sometimes even, even anti-EU. And this was quite a quite a quite a quite an issue for many of those who who kind of uh, uh, would recognize themselves as being rather constructive and, and pro-European when it comes to in general uh, the EU policies. And fourth, and I will stop here because the time is limited. Uh, uh, should the I would argue that should the future and the resilience of the EU and its economic and monetary union, for instance have been debated in the parliamentary elections here in, in Finland in 2019, and also in the context of the EP elections during the same year, I would think that there would have been much more uh, possibilities for a nuanced and meaningful EU debate about the economic recovery package uh, here in Helsinki during the past summer. But I will stop now here and pass the floor back to Jarmo and then to our panel. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Many Juha, thanks. Um, and obviously Michal as well. Um, you certainly make the case for a, for a more analytical look at, at the, um, the Euroscepticism as a phenomenon and, uh, and in terms of maybe looking at the that the whole issue of criticism more from the point of view of of uh, of what is analytical and what is unnecessarily polarizing and, and maybe not so meaningful in uh, in terms of uh, of finding solutions to the european problems but uh, uh, once again i will i will make the point that it is possible to ask questions in the chat i already see there are two questions and uh, i will raise them both uh, as we go on but first i will move on to uh, the members of the European Parliament and give them the chance to take the floor. Um, first in line would be Vice President Otmar Karas from the EPP European People's Party Group. Uh, Otmar, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, dear Heidi, uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much for your invitation and your initiative. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you uh, today. 
uh, in view of the conference of the future of Europe, which will hopefully start uh, soon uh, as a dialogue with the citizens. I think that is the most important thing uh, debate about the future of Europe. We don't need more conferences and we don't need more expert uh, groups. We need a strong dialogue with our citizens to bring our citizens back to the European project, uh, which will hopefully, uh, it is, book comes just at the right moment. Uh, it is an ideal basis of the debate for the debate and what response the European Union needs to give, what actions to take in order to gain the democratic majorities to do the right and the necessary. I would like to thank the editors, Mr. Pollack, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Kading, the experts in the member states, the Finnish liaison office together with the Finnish Institute for International Affairs in Helsinki, for helping to shed light on the important issues of Euroscepticism and the future of Europe. But you mentioned it correctly. We, uh, we know that Euroscepticism has many different phases all over, over Europe. I would not reduce Euroscepticism to exclusively Eurosceptic parties. In my eyes, the problems, problem is not the 26.2% of members in the European Parliament are Eurosceptic. The problem is uh, the kind of political willingness for cooperation, uh, the, the public dialogue about our problems. It is definitely easier to blame the European Union than to communicate the benefit of the European uh, compromise. It is much easier uh, to give, to have a, to, to, yeah, to, 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 to start with a national perspective against Europe as to discuss a common solution of our challenges and the problems uh, we have. Uh, the, According to the European, uh, to the to the Eurobarometer survey conducted after the EP elections, the most important issue for the general public were economy and growth, climate change, human rights and democracy. These are horizontal issues that no member states can tackle alone. The current health crisis has demonstrated this even more clearly. And look to the crisis in the last 10 years. The, the financial crisis, the refugee issue, the migration debate, the, uh, now the corona issue, the climate uh, problems and uh, environmental issues. Uh, all these problems we have shows us that the European Union is not ready. We have to continue the European idea. That is the necessity, not to go back to national interests. We, we have to debate the problems, the reasons for the problems, and the borders we have inside the European Union uh, not only physically on the, on the national border, politically in the competence, in the financial issues, and in the public understanding to can solve this problem. But uh, uh, these horizontal issues that no member states can tackle alone, the current, uh, what Julia Juha Jokela suggested, a solution for Finland, is in my eyes part of the solution in all member states in a different way. The closure for national debates on EU affairs is very dangerous for the European democracy. Uh, for me, Europe stands for rule of law, for democracy, for respect, for anti-discrimination, 
for common values, for com compromise, for dialogue, and also for the political willingness to understand another better uh, and to to create a new atmosphere of solving our common European and global challenges, problems we have on the table. But Europe does not mean yes or no. And yes or no, yes European Union, no European Union, not all Eurosceptics are against the European Union. We have to split the Eurosceptics between the people who are against the project or the people who have worries, questions, special ideas, and a different personal issue for their skepticism. But I think the most important problem are not the citizens. The most important problem is the communication of some of the governments in our member states about their involvement as part of the European Union. The people don't understand how the European Union is working and what the, the, the power of the member states, the regions and the citizens are inside this decision making process. To the end, we need to explain, communicate Europe our decisions on European level. This also means the heads of states and governments need to explain their decisions on European level at home. We have two European legislators, the Chamber of Regions, that are the governments, and the Chamber of Citizens, that is the European uh, Parliament. We need to listen to the concerns of people and seek dialogue in times of this for disinformation, polarization, hate speeches. It is more important than ever to have besides fact-based information in exchange of ideas, dialogues, the respect for and solidarity with each other. Uh, this also, so we have to say, you can clearly see the problems we have. This is the debate on the MFF, the next generation EU recovery plan, the refugees on the Greek island, the indexation of family benefits, just to name a few. On these issues, even parties in government, which are traditionally pro-European, are playing with Euroscepticism, and that is the problem. The European populists, the European skeptic politicians are sitting in the center of the government, sitting also in our political parties and not only on the extreme left and on the extreme right. So we have to go forward. We have to discuss the common goals of the European Union and we have to encourage the European idea as an answer of, to our problems and not is a reason of our problems we have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Harry. Uh, and next we turn to, um, to Vice President Heidi Hautala. Heidi, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure to discuss with uh, Michal Kading and uh, Juha Jokela and uh, colleagues uh, Otmar Karas and Mia Petra Kumpula. Um, and I would say that um, um, I very much appreciate this um, um, uh, uh, title we have our, for ourselves towards meaningful criticism of the EU, which actually should be our everyday practice because we cannot um, do a situation where the uh, EU would even be close to realizing its full potential if we don't uh, permanently engage ourselves in a, in a meaningful criticism of, of uh, what we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we could have. And um, I'm sure that um, a very vast majority uh, in the European Parliament actually share this notion that uh, the EU is a unique creation. There's nothing like it. And I see uh, Otmar is smiling, <laughs> so with me. 
there's nothing like the European Union in the world. And um, of course, we being in this um, uh, multi-political, uh, multi-national uh, 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 parliament, we know it better than most other people. And it's our duty to, to share our observations and ideas with the public. And I, I hope that uh, the conference on the future of Europe will really open up to the citizens in, in its multitude and uh, varieties, because there's not just one public, of course. But, um, but um, starting from this idea that we still have um, a lot to do in order to uh, come to a situation where the EU has uh, really taken its place in the world uh, towards other geopolitical powers and, of course, also towards its citizens. Um, there's, there's a challenge right now, uh, but I also, I, I recognize um, uh, the, the criticism of, um, of Otmar Karas towards the governments, because this is also something that I'm sure that most of us in the European Parliament share, that um, we feel that um, the national leaders still all too often they hide behind Brussels and they this is of course a little bit of a cliche but it's still happening after every European summit is that um, the bad achieve bad shit things um, were caused by Brussels and the great achievements by by the prime minister or the government of the men, member states and I think this is a bad habit and it would be hard time to get rid of it because indeed um, uh, I think one of the obstacles for the EU to reach its full potential is uh, the sort of, um, I would say, almost like cowardly uh, behavior by, by our national leaders to see uh, face to face the challenges that we have in the global uh, situation today, that a, a member state, as we have seen it, a nation state is, is far from being able to meet those global challenges from climate change to to uh, poverty and uh, growing inequalities. So, so I think that uh, it's our task now to see that. Uh, and let me say that we have new opportunities at this very moment um, if we see uh, the changes um, across the Atlantic. And um, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the EU will get again an ally from the United States with the leadership of, of uh, President should I say, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris, because um, um, Trump was the, one of the biggest bullies to try to stop the European Union to becoming what it has to become by the side of some other autocratic leaders like Putin. And, and I'm, I predict that uh, Prime Minister Johnson will now be in, 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 in deep trouble because he cannot continue this sort of um, uh, game with with Trump anymore to to try to bring the EU down and I'm I'm I've seen that uh, some people now say some researchers that uh, also the UK um, with its Brexit has to build a new relationship with the United States through uh, the engaging with the European Union if not as a member but as a very close ally and we of course live very critical moments here well then um, on, on uh, the actual challenges inside, I think um, um, I have to um, pinch myself sometimes to see that our uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen is so determined to, to, to a kind of a um, transformation of our system towards uh, what she calls the Green Deal. I think it's really uh, it's a paradigm shift that we are facing now and we are in it together in the European Parliament, we're trying to find solutions which uh, also show the way that to the um, uh, EU to use this recovery package, uh, our multi-annual uh, budget in, in the best possible way to create additional value uh, uh, together vis-a-vis -vis what could have done by, could, could be done by member states separately. And I think this is one of the biggest promises for the whole world today that uh, we are uh, treading on a path which is trying to, to show that a continent of the size and importance of the European Union can really be uh, on its uh, way towards uh, environmental and social sustainability. And I, I would like to conclude by saying that um, I trust very much um, the fact that um, 
if the EU will set this right now, if it will be able to convince its governments and its uh, citizens that the EU can take a leadership position in the world in order to, to face, uh, uh, really to find solutions to the challenges we have. So um, I, I close my circle by saying that indeed the EU as a unique uh, um, construction has now a a place to take a leadership in, in, in the world, together with like-minded allies, in order to, to save the planet and humanity, and nothing less than that. Thank you. Many thanks, Heidi. And then we turn to Mia Petrikumpulanantri from the S&D group. Mia, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm very happy to continue after two colleagues and vice chairs as they brought to the table very well the spirit of the European Parliament, the 80 percent, because we do see that there is a momentum to go further and there is the momentum that we have actually very good plan. I also pinch me when having the EPP chair for the commission that fully uh, respect, uh, respects the, the broad uh, possibilities that also my group SND and, and for so I think it is very broad and balanced now. Uh, and then if you have the, the uh, uh, very strong EU critics that EU should not exist, it's of course uh, very difficult to get them on board. But at the same time, I said there is a good and broad uh, big picture in mind. Uh, we all the time uh, are criticizing that we are not delivering and doing enough. So the kind of uh, EP bubble uh, and the EU bubble, we have the researches even that cost of non-delivering. European Parliament research services have many files that what could we do better? So we have this criticism. And then also, uh, I, I just last night was reminded of the dear uh, former colleague, Jeff who fought so much for uh, anti-Brexit campaigns. And now when Brexit is happening soon. He uh, tweeted, and I retweeted, because it really gave the, the feeling that uh, now some people are celebrating that immigration will stop and that the free movement will stop. And that is the mood you have inside now from some conservative MEPs who wanted to have the Brexit. And at the same time, you have a totally different angle. Chef Dance was like crying that, hey, we are the only nation in the Western Europe that will have stop of the freedom of movement. Our children, uh, we, our students, our workers, we are not able to move freely. And so what is this about celebrating? So this really gives the perspective from which angle you look the very same issue. And I, I just wonder, don't they even think that they are limiting themselves in the island and not only uh, having the, the thoughts of what will happen to the others? So I, I think also when we, uh, put too easily together the skepticism or anti-EU with the uh, ideas that EU should be different. Uh, it also goes from the, the language used. And I don't even see the world for the national state skepticism, even though we too often see that nationalism is uh, putting uh, challenges for the uh, political goals that we want to set. Uh, and so there may be nationalism is, is the word that we many of us fear, that it, it goes too far, it is dangerous. But then uh, uh, this is also that we are too eagerly uh, concentrating on the EU skepticism as a negative part. And that's why I welcome this paper. Uh, at this point, I want to also say that we do not too much uh, emphasize the positive things on the EU. And that's what I try to do on my daily political work. And it was quite surprised to me that how surprisingly it was for many people when I was speaking, especially during the campaign and before the lockdowns, um, that was it uh, technological CEOs or was it uh, even the banking people or was it the people at the market space? When I asked that, what is the share of the European economy in the world. And people could not tell. Not even the insurance company uh, people who were dealing with the uh, money every day uh, and then uh, big money like insurance companies. And then when you start to say that, hey, come on, we have 20% of the global economy. 
in our hands. We can deliver a lot. And then you got the imagination that what you gonna do. So what you wanna do with this EU? So it's not only that to prevent war or, or you know, take the history uh, after the World War II, we were able very quickly to create this. And young people said, yeah, nice, what about today? So, so then uh, having then this, this fact, you can say that, do we want to protect our workers? Do we want to protect our privacy against the big tech? Do we want to set what kind of cars do we want to use in this continent? Or do you believe if we set some rules that Facebook will disappear, they will leave us, or then the car manufacturers won't sell any cars to Europe because they have to have the belt and then less emissions. So I, I think this is also the angle that we have not been using enough to show very concrete power that we have, and which uh, Heidi and, and Otmar Pohl said that we are not relieving, but then going back to those national leaders that do not have the same spirit as the MEPs because they have maybe 90% of their work internal affairs and then they go to the meet council colleagues and come back that whether they won the race in EU or then uh, they explain the losing. So I, I want to uh, continue the positive uh, ideas uh, as an example and also wish that the national politicians can do more there. Uh, I last mandate, I uh, was the first time member and I, I was the rapporteur for the roaming regulation. When I talk about the roaming everywhere in Europe, and it was the study done that 70% of the Europeans recognize it. And this was something good and concrete that the uh, parliament and uh, Europe, Europe gave them. Now it's less a praise because we cannot travel. <laughs> but anyway, so then, uh, I, and I felt as made that I've been into EU politics for 20 years in national parliament and, and then there, and I talk about one di uh, directive. But it is also at the same time that you have to show the examples, what are you doing and not talk about the institution itself. So if we want to have the EU led by institutions or EU led by the policy goals and the tools to do it, we have to change our own way of talking about these issues and as well. So also you had to get to well the, the recovery and a very interesting analysis on that one. And then on the recovery for me, uh, to bring in that discussion to Finland was that the figures that think about what the other uh, uh, continent they do, if EU start, uh, doesn't make the recovery funds also together on the top of the um, national uh, remunerations and uh, then compare that to the Japan, who was doing like 20% of the GDP, USA doing and China started doing, and EU could say, no, we can't. Is there any kind of industry left here? Or do we think about that it's the borders or it could not fund? So I, I think this is also that we really have to do. Then where, when you, have, you said that uh, any, any, uh, any skepticism or criticism on that was taught as a, a opposition, yes, I recognize it was the local EPP that was then claimed to be too close to the true Finns. But then at some stage, it was also that it, it is not the Finnish people alone to decide what kind of uh, recovery to do. And then we, we actually come to the question that how bright ideas can we have as a national parties or national thinkers or individuals? Because I will finish here, the beauty of the politics is in the end to have the compromises. And that is maybe the challenge that we have. And then you have those people who never want to com have having the compromises. So um, maybe we have a lot to learn why all the Europeans now follow how many counts are left in uh, Georgia, uh, which they can maybe not even put on the pl place on the map that detailedly, but we the US election. Even my yoga teachers finishes every time that now you might need these uh, breathing technology uh, techniques in, in the <laughs> elections to come. So it's everywhere, the US elections in Europe. Where do we have the possibility for the similar impetus for the European elections? But we hope uh, at the same time we don't have to, because there you see the extreme divisions. It is whether or not, and this is not the Europe we want to go. So we still have to try to make the clear messages and be able to negotiate. And this is the difficulty that sometimes if it's not, if the parliament is not able to form the majorities, then we end up in the 
situation that Europe cannot deliver. So we we do the fight uh, in between the different political parties, in the committees, in the uh, parliament uh, speaking and so, but in the end we see the, the beauty of the politics that compromise will lead us forward and this is important. Thank you. Many thanks Mia Petra. I think what we can we can take from these commentaries at least among the things we can take from these three commentaries is that Europe is not a finished ready-made product but uh, and, and on this un unfinished journey uh, we should all be mindful that criticism or critical attitude is is an integral part of, uh, of, of democratic process and we should look at the Euroscepticism and, and criticism especially minimum criticism also from from th this angle um, other aspect which came up, I think, in all three commentaries and also two of two questions that we have in the chat is the need for dialogue with citizens and the need for efficient communication and uh, and transparency about Europe and its goals. Um, um, at this moment, I remind the speakers and the and the panelists that there is a raise the hand function in the in the Teams platform, so you can ask for the floor there. But maybe I will just directly ask maybe Michal and you to uh, to comment this issue about uh, whether lack of transparency or poor communication has contributed to the uh, to the rise of Euroscepticism and and whether that is uh, one of one of the solutions to. Uh, uh, towards meaningful criticism instead of, of, of simplified polarization. Uh, Mikhail, would you take the floor here? Yes, thank you very much for all these very thought-provoking uh, commentaries. I have been following now for the last 45 minutes. Extremely eye-opening. Um, with, with regard to your question, I mean, I think what the journey, what the book, what the research has shown, um, not only by ourselves, but also by a lot of academics working on on issues around how to improve the European Union, how to involve citizens. I, th I think the key is that we do not need anything centralized from Brussels but that we need to actually invest in the member states and that this communication has to basically um, very much put forward by the member states um, um, respectively. We need your parliament offices, we need the commission being present in the member states and vi via the members of the European Parliament to communicate as very much was put forward. Because in the end, we are very much united in diversity. I mean, this is not just a slogan, this is a this is just the case. I mean, you have made the point very clearly. All EU member states and respectively the citizens, they have very different interests why they are part in the European Union. The Finns have a very much strong security uh, interest to be part of all the various projects amongst others. But then we have other countries that have a very other interest. They are much more Hungarians uh, very often and, and Poles, they would argue that it is now actually time for Europe to show solidarity vis-a-vis -vis the Poles and vis-a-vis -vis Hungary because of the history, because of the past. They have a very different understanding or many uh, in the respective countries. They are very pro-European. If you look at Hungarians or Polish Poles, citizens are very pro-European, but they have a very different perception of Europe. They have really much the, the, the expectation that now is time uh, to pay back, to pay back for what went wrong in the very past. And if you start going from one country to the other, you will see uh, the differences. And maybe one last point, you have made this point with Finland and the recovery fund, and that, um, right, the Finns party now emerges again as the only credible alternative in the political spectrum because all the other parties are more or less, well, maybe not full-heartedly, but uh, following most likely uh, the idea then in national parliament for the approval, for the ratification um, of, of, these, uh, recovery, of this recovery package. 
But look at Germany, a totally different story. We have the alternative for Germany, a car party that popped up because of the economic and financial crisis in 2009. And where is it now? It is not present anywhere related to the recovery fund. So this is, I think, these dynamics have to be understood. And I think this is very difficult to be coordinated from, let's say, from Brussels as such. This can be, there can be frameworks, there can be um, ideas of how to go and reach out together with the Committee of the Regions. I think that was a very important point as well, Mr. Kara's point put forward, like regional hubs that we start not thinking Europe in terms of here are the borders, but COVID and other challenges show us that actually regional cooperation is might be actually the solution and the trick because people um, in Munich have less, much less in common with people in Berlin, but much more with people uh, in Austria. So this is what that needs to be addressed. And this is how we could think in terms of regional cooperation, strengthening this regional hub idea, um, just another idea um, um, in with regard and in light of the Conference on the Future of Europe, engaging citizens, but not stopping at the borders but thinking European wide by thinking maybe what is the problem that might be uh, solved regionally. So let's have regional citizens assemblies and not national citizens assemblies. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. Again, a uh, very interesting uh, and you certainly make the make the make the argument for for further engagement and about in a sense Having the dialogue between different visions of Europe uh, as part of part of the uh, uh, the future and and also the conference, which hopefully will start soon. But I will turn to maybe you also for comments on what the members of the parliament said, and uh, maybe also to discuss this issue about the uh, about communication and transparency and and what role that that might have. I mean, and also this. Thing that came up in terms of of whether the national politicians who who go to Brussels, I mean, might have a different view of communication compared to the institutions which are which are based in in Brussels. You, would you like to comment on that? Yes, thank you very much, Jarmo, and thank you, of course, for excellent commentaries and, and eye-opening uh, uh, ideas from the European Parliament. In many respect, uh, my general comment on those were that I think this was uh, kind of exactly what I was trying to uh, uh, highlight in my own remarks in a way that uh, we should talk about the EU through concrete uh, issues, concrete policy decisions, whether it's its position in global affairs, whether it's a migration matter, whether it is a, a, any significant policy matter. And this is where, of course, EU plays a, a, an, an increasingly and, and a notable role and has implications for for national uh, uh, national uh, 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 level as well. And this is exactly what kind of debate and discussion uh, is needed in a way that, that not one uh, element of the integration, let's now say the recovery package or the ideas about fiscal union kind of hijacks the whole EU discussion or debate. And I think this is to some extent what we have seen in Finland, of course, there has been now debate and 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 I uh, of course Michael mentioned that the, there is a kind of the danger that the Eurosceptic party or the or the kind of the it's not necessarily danger but kind of the challenge that the Eurosceptic party emerges as the only credible alternative and and I think this is this is this, there are some uh, elements which suggest to that direction but this is still a little bit open uh, issue and game in a way that I think we have also seen that. Uh, that there is a, a quite a vivid debate and different positions taken and this might then in the end actually contribute to the sort of a more meaningful and full uh, picture of the issue. But of course what happened during the summer it was very much sort of a yes no framing and, and, and the, uh, very similar issue happened I would say that what happened during the uh, first months of the euro crisis. But then on terms of the transparency issue and I think this is a very important question and I think this is something what many of the uh, academic researchers have tried to address and of course there is a little bit of a interesting insights which also relates to the year 95 because uh, the Nordic members as well as Austria is often seen that they are bringing in the transparency question to the EU and in the Brussels scene especially more forcefully and I think they have uh, if you look back I think there's been some successes as well.
And this is also kind of a question what I often often mention when discussed that whether EU should be an international organization or a more sort of a full-fledged political system, <laughs> even a federation, that we should look critically what kind of actors international organizations are and what kind of transparency uh, 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 practices they they have, for instance. And I think this is kind of an element what we should keep in mind that when the EU has been developing towards a more full-fledged political system, the question of transparency related to the institutions in Brussels is obviously a very legitimate one. And I think it has been addressed, but I wouldn't go as far as say that, that the system is perfect. And, and, and I think many member states have witnessed that there are different political cultures which kind of have implications to the kind of a certain uh, level and 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 the kind of the type of transparency that is seen as a requirement for a political system to work. But I think the main question here also relates to the book edited by Michal and 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 his colleagues is also that the, the and it was mentioned also by the by the several uh, 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 commentators here that the, the challenge is is also very much and, and Michal as well the challenge is very much on the national level. That you know, even if there are possibilities for transparency in a way that the information is available, but what becomes a kind of information which is politically debated uh, openly uh, with the citizens, and what remains behind the kind of the closed door meetings of uh, here in Finland, for instance, the Grand Committee, uh, uh, which oversees the EU affairs in the Finnish Parliament. I think that's the relevant question. So, so what I try to encourage in my short uh, two, three pager in the book is that uh, that the parties would openly discuss and, and, and show kind of courage to take these issues out of the committees and cabinets and, 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 and also not to be afraid about the political reaction and kind of a, the kind of the potentially challenging political elements of some of these questions, because I think that the, this is not the last crisis and the EU is, is has become it has become a political matter for the citizens and that's why it would be good to have a continuous uh, political dis discussion about its policies as well as the future direction of it. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks you have. Uh, you're, you're running lots of belts there, um, but certainly certainly the, the issue of, uh, of transparency and, and communication came out very clearly there. Um, something that Johan mentioned there as well was the the uh, the question and um, the whether whether the challenge of of your skepticism might have brought what what kind of different kinds of positives and negatives it might have have brought along and uh, and that might already have contributed I think last year uh, to the record high turnout in the European elections um, so I would maybe next turn to our uh, members of the parliament maybe for for their views on on uh, the impact of your skepticism on on the political decision making etc and and what what we have in in the chat the uh, actually are uh, several questions which uh, relate to to the the what what we can do in terms of trying to prevent polarization and uh, and and whether we 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 are able to somehow uh, go beyond the yes and no questions and, and how this has maybe been done within the European uh, Parliament and, and in the European decision-making system so far. So maybe if Vice President Karasi, would you like to, to take the floor next? Uh, firstly, I think that the, the main point is Europe is a democracy and each member state is part of the decision-making process. That is, it is never, it's never the, the, the question Brussels or Helsinki, Brussels or Vienna. It's always the question, everybody is doing what he wants or we are doing it together. That is the main issue. It's not a question Brussels or Helsinki. All member states are part of the legislative process and decision-making process in the European Union. I think the main point is we have to explain that all governments, all executive institutions on the national level are legislators on the European level. 
That is the main point. Secondly, the European Parliament, I think, is most is, is one of the most transparent institutions in Europe. There is no closed door meeting. You can ask all your members in the European Parliament as representatives of the citizens what they are doing, why they are voting in favor, abstain or against, when you can do it with the members on the national level. The members of the national level are all normally part of the party decision. The members of the European Parliament are responsible for their own individual decision. My, my wish to you is use the, the social media accounts of the members of your country in the European Parliament and the social media accounts of the political groups and the European Parliament. All informations, all invest, uh, amendments, all speeches, all interventions are there, are in. So please use what we are doing. Communication is not only a responsibility for the members of the European Parliament and the European institutions, it is also a responsibility of the governments and the national parliaments uh, and also of the political parties in the member states and the regional parliaments. They are all part of the decision making process. So we have to bring the, the, the different political levels uh, together, we are part of the European Union. All national citizens are also European citizens. And you spoke, you, you mentioned it right. We are di diverse, yes, united in diversity. But we have common rules. We have a common responsibility. We have common challenges. We have common problem, uh, problems, we have common values, we, are, we have a common structure, nämlich a liberal democracy that is totally different to other uh, continents in the world. The, the issues are unite us are much more than the issues are divided us. And that we have to communicate also in the member states. And I think Nobody knows, nobody is too much, that 94% of the whole EU budget are investments in the regions of our member states. Only 5% of the whole European budget is for the administration in the European Union. The, the, the membership fee to the European Union is an investment into our future. One euro back to the member states are three euros investment. About it is in the hand of our villages, of our mayors, of our regional and national parliamentarians and governments to explain the citizens what we achieved together. We have pictures, we have projects in our member states, and we have much more to discuss that the common projects, refugee issues, climate change, migration issue, democracy, yes, Africa, hunger in the world, and the, 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 the cleavage in our society, the cross-border cleavage of our society, Corona strengthens our cleavage in our society. The European Union has to solve this cleavage in our society in, the, in, in terms that we have to cooperate. We have to look for common uh, solutions. And I think if we are explaining that we are part of this project, this project is not ready, we have the people on board. Stop the blaming of the European Union. Explain the real that the benefit of, the, of this project. Stop to lie. Say what is true. 
that is what I wish use the, 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 the social media accounts of the European Parliament and your colleagues in the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Karas. Um, and then maybe I would turn to uh, to Heidi Hautala. Um, I mean, you've been involved in uh, in several transparency initiatives, and you might also wish to comment on this issue of of member states' ownership and also the citizens' ownership of the of the European Union and how transparency might might enable that. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jarmo. Um, well, I I I do believe that. Um, those who are to any degree active in their societies or communities uh, at national or regional or local level, um, which means that they are involved in some kind of communal activity in some associations or, or what it could be. So they easily find their ways also to influence the EU. So I would also say that there is no sort of shortcut to, to, to the citizen to influence the EU directly but it goes through this kind of engagement in society and law and by and large. Um, and um, I, I took note of a very sad um, uh, research that which shows that in Finland, this kind of um, uh, civic um, uh, identity is weaker than in many other countries, uh, especially it was uh, in relation to Sweden, which I think is, is much more developed in its kind of civic culture and sort of democratic uh, participation in society. But I think we have to address this issue of um, why not more people in general want to have a say in, in the world around themselves. And it can start from the next door, you know, next block. It doesn't have to, to be global activities first, but it's easy to find a way to, to, to even to influence global issues through the EU if you, if you have this kind of civic identity and self-confidence that you feel that you're a part of something bigger than just you you and your family and then you can make a change so i wouldn't uh, sort of um, uh, think that this um, how to influence the eu is is in any way separated from how we influence our, our communities and municipalities and regions and and and, and states uh, on transparency um, I, I, of course, agree very much with what Otmar has said, that it's, it's the issue is, is with the member states. And Jarmo, you also, well, who, who was it who mentioned that um, they have different political cultures? But um, I think it's important to sort of try to, to take every possibility to expand that access to information for the citizens. And um, that's what some of us have been doing, e even by, by taking uh, the institutions to court when we feel that they put unjustified hurdles to, to uh, access to civic and public access to information. So every action like that has a potential to expand the sphere of transparency. And um, that's something that I think um, still has to continue. Then on, on, an, on a separate note, um, I think Mia Petra said something quite important, and Otmar, I think, um, also mentioned it, that in the European Parliament, um, you can see that 80% um, of the membership actually participates in, in very detailed discussions and negotiations on how specific laws and regulations should look like. And um, uh, what you can uh, notice is that uh, the let's say the ID group uh, and uh, the sort of national populist nationalists they're not really interested in the detail of legislation they do not they you know this is for them the question is that how can we prove that there's too much Europe and that's their sort of raison d'etre that's their legitimacy but um, the 80 percent of us are struggling every day this morning I had a negotiation where, where we can see that it's like four or four, five groups that are sort of uh, trying to find constructive solutions to, to legislation that we want to see. So that's a very, I think it's a big achievement and we have to cherish that. We have to see that, uh, that there will be not too many cleavages, unnecessary political uh, cleavages within this sort of 80% who are able to, 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 to show the way forward. And of course, it's sometimes painful because then you you feel you're losing your identity. But I think we all can explain that it's better than than staying alone in your corner and trying to to feel that you are right. 
So that's what I'd like to say, that the art of compromise is something that is very important. Thank you, Heidi. And uh, next we turn to Mia Petra Kumpula Natri. Mia Petra, you're free to comment on uh, on the previous previous interventions, but I will maybe just phrase you a question that we have also on the chat um, about who is going to be renewing democracy for a digital age, considering your your roles in the parliament, both in the ITRA committee and now in the new new uh, special committee on artificial intelligence. I mean, maybe you would like to expand on the question of, of how this digital age is is playing into this issue of, of engagement with citizens and, and, and going forward. That's a good question, as, as we are now studying the, the, the possible proposals for the Biden administration. And I uh, do share hopes that uh, even in his campaign and then a part of the Democrats and also bipartisan studies carried on in the legislation there during last mandate was tackling the question of the role of the big tech, that it is not a, a market anymore, it is the monopoly. So that's quite interesting to put the, the foods together to see do we find common tools to tackle uh, the, the, the threats to democracy when when the power of uh, uh, exchanging of information is in the hands of one or two. If you think really that we should, as uh, 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 countries or security or the disease, whatever, to reach your citizens, we've normally said that there is the uh, involvement of the public television channels and the radios, that they have to have the alarm systems. And nowadays it's not reaching the Finnish people, at least as we are using only the mobile. The, uh, communication most in the world. I'm using the same pad that I'm now using for my televisions and, and as well. So then uh, actually we're in the situation that COVID, applica COVID application showed that there is two systems, iOS and Android, and then you have to reach the citizens. And what if there is no regulation that they say, well, we don't want your application in. As Apple said for uh, Fortnite, one of the biggest, most popular computer games. So then we do have to find uh, uh, solutions and it's easier if we have the more global players on, on board on that one and then to have a system. So I, I think we are, yes, in a busy, but then at the same time we are saying that Europe wants to have the uh, rules that we are our values and, and shared values cross parties. And now the question is, is that 20 percent or almost 20 percent of the EU skeptics, are they EU skeptics because EU stands for rule of law because EU stands for human rights and EU stands for the minority rights. Because that was the division in US that you start snaggering it bit by bit. And, and also I wanted to comment here on this right left uh, question as that it was taken up in the book that whether it's the right uh, uh, only uh, to have it. Yes, there has been uh, the movements in the in the left who has been EU uh, criticism uh, and then uh, not anymore that powerful that they were but it has been there all the time and then maybe uh, also a big part of that is now a, a little bit to say that the grown green party the, and then it comes for the criticism for the economical models that they, how, how does it harm the system the free trade is a, is a question uh, the the power of empowerment of the uh, workers during the digital age so there are many old questions that we still do have the the talks and when we go to the details that how to have it but i think this is the best framework to have it to have it together also at the european level uh, and not say so this is what i try to bring and i think we have succeeded in some issues in finnish debates that if we want to tackle some questions that our shoulders are too small compared to the EU shoulders. And I, I do this every time twice to remind that the, our share of the world economy is almost 20%. So when we do want to have the, the climate uh, resolutions, it doesn't, or, or the decisions, it doesn't help Finland will be neutral in 35. We need the EU to do it. And then you ask a, 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 even a true Finn person that do you want to have it by regulating the Finnish price of the gasoline for the, your car or you want that the Europe sets rules for what kind of cars are available in the markets. And I think the answer is quite clear. And then what we need, we need Europe to do and deliver. 
so so this is where I think it. And on all the other comment on the left and right, so the Brexit was a, a, a thing that it was not at all only right wing populists who vote for the Brexit. Uh, we saw many, many uh, Labour colleagues that really knew their constituency and they've been always working in EU as a pro-European MEPs and still their constituency turned to uh, vote for Brexit because they didn't feel that EU was giving them what was needed and it was in the salaries, the part of the, the globalization uh, that also brought Europe uh, richness and it didn't help them. So that was, uh, I, I also think that in the, the program that we have now, we have lessened learned that this is not climate and digital and social Europe that we are bringing. And also, uh, uh, bring brought some ideas on the, the uh, indexing and so. But then the last comment on, on this uh, division is that uh, sometimes it's not easy to say that the populistic party, they are right or left, because it, it blurs. Uh, if you are a peace and you promise 100 euro, or how was it, uh, uh, the, the child benefits? Or if you are Sweden Democrat, you promise uh, female uh, women's not to be taxed uh, according their own risk, but the, the family taxation kind of thing, which is not for the women actually against, but then could be chosen from the different ways. Or uh, Italy, minimum pay, uh, minimum, uh, it was the populistic movements that promised a very, very good uh, social benefits. And that was the problem for us in the European Social Democratic Party at the same time, try to say that you still have your rules and, and something that to be looked at that we can survive. So there is easy to be populistic on the many stands and then um, happy to also have this discussion with the colleagues from the different parties as we all have the realities how difficult sometimes is making the compromises and then the final say will be the few uh, weeks or days from here to come that how to then defend the MFF that cut so many issues or <laughs> didn't fulfill fully the green cap or didn't fully said that the social Europe is there now. But then we said that this is steps for the good uh, direction. And as far as we can say, win, win, win for Europe, it is uh, nice and easy to be an MEP for this uh, century, to say. Thank you, Mia Petra. Um, what we have certainly heard from, from all the members of the European Parliament is that, that making compromises is essential part of, uh, of decision making. And that obviously means something else than, than yes and no on, on, on the big question of whether we want to have Europe or, or not. Um, time flies. Um, this uh, has, has been very interesting and I'm sure that the discussion could have taken many other turns. We have a few questions also there which unfortunately we are not able to raise fully but uh, but I will turn turn back to um, our expert speakers for for final comments and I would maybe like to uh, just to just to put to them the question of of, uh, uh, of the more global value of uh, renewing European project for the future um, maybe comment on the on the upcoming conference on the future of Europe and and what promise it holds and and how important you consider it in the in 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 generating uh, a more meaningful criticism and, and changing maybe some of the popular discourse in Europe towards a more analytical direction and uh, and, and how important Europe is in the in the world I mean we've just seen the uh, uh, the U.S. elections may be changing a little bit the transatlantic dynamic and uh, and we have here questions otherwise also about the importance of Europe's leadership going going forward um, in terms of global politics. So so maybe if, if you, had, you start and then, then Mikhail continues final remarks and, and thoughts based on the discussion today. Well, I think the, my final thought on the discussion is that this is exactly what we would need it. And it was a great pleasure to discuss also with the members of the European Parliament and bringing this kind of a European uh, uh, perspective to our national debate. I think this is this is what it's all about in a way, understanding that 
that the politics in the European Parliament and at the EU level is very much also also about national question and, and citizens in Finland can take part of it in, in, in many ways. I think the, the comments that came from the from the members of the parliament were extremely useful in many respects. Now I have to say that because we are already a little bit over time, so so answering the questions about EU's global role is a, is a little bit a taunting task, uh, and I'm I'm quite certain that FIA will return to this theme uh, because it seems to generate quite a quite a bit of um, uh, interest here in, in 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 Finland as well. Of course, we have a new election result now in the US and the transatlantic transatlantic links as well as their implications for EU's global role are a pertinent question. Uh, and um, my only uh, kind of a, a memory related to that is, 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 is that I, I happened to be in, in Paris when, when Obama took the office after George uh, W. Bush's era, which, which was somewhat divisive for the, for the well, very divisive uh, for, the, for the EU's foreign policy. And there was a kind of a, a great celebration that the Obama will bring in the moment uh, to kind of steer the world. And, uh, and, and in that respect, that of course happened as well. There was a lot of transatlantic cooperation. But at the same time, we, we, we somewhat saw uh, a kind of the, the member states and the EU itself seem to lose some of the, some of the stamina and some of the uh, motivation to develop its policies further. And we've been pondering whether this was because of very successful experience with the EU could kind of uh, uh, lower a little bit of its own ambitions. And what I really hope now that would not happen is that uh, even if uh, there would be a transatlantic uh, possibilities to steer the global developments, I think all of those possibilities needs to be seized. But however, I think the world is changing to a direction uh, in which the EU must be more capable of, of defending its own values and interests, also alone if, if need be. And this is of course a huge agenda if we think about the foreign and security policy or more broadly the external relations, where of course the EU has more competencies and, and also, also uh, influence and power in the field of economy but is, is more um, and doesn't have such, such a tools available to it in the field of uh, traditional foreign and security policies. So, so I hope that the, that the, that the uh, developments and initiatives that have been mushrooming in the previous years will kind of continue also in the more brighter uh, future, uh, in the context of more brighter transatlantic cooperation. Benedict, you have um, you have was there already setting a, a future research agendas as well. Um, Michael, um, for your final comments on the basis of the discussion today, uh, what did you gather from uh, from from the debate today? And and maybe you could just maybe look forward, try to see. I mean, how does the future look like in terms of of generating a meaningful debate in the context of the of the upcoming conference on the future of yes. Europe? Thank you very much. Well, first of all, the future is Europe. Uh, I think that has become very clear. And I think I'm very happy about this um, as a very nice conclusion of this panel. And the second thing, and I think that also links very nicely to the discussions we have had, we don't have to someone to act or someone to prepare or to kick off the conference on the future of Europe now with the EU German presidency. It might not work during the EU German presidency, and so what? There have been so many activities already just taking the whole discussion we have around the Conference on the Future of Europe to just organize uh, on the ground online dialogues, transnational online citizens dialogues, citizens assemblies all over Europe, French think tanks organizing and inviting discussion panels. We have citizens assemblies on gender equality happening. We have ac active engagements of EU citizens in implementation of specific EU policies. We have initiatives actually happening all over Europe already without having the formal kickoff, so to say. And this is exactly what Europe is about and also should be. We don't have to wait for a few to tell us what to do, but 
I think um, Heidi also mentioned this very nicely. Um, it is us on the grounds, uh, in the municipalities, on the local grounds, like Mr. Kara said, the local assemblies, it's parliamentarians, parliamentarians. It is those that have responsibility and want to take up responsibility, the youngs uh, across Europe uh, that have to set the agenda. And this is already happening and we just have to talk about it. We have to communicate these positive messages because also Brexit, of course, it has a lot of uh, in a lot of uh, in terms of um, uh, trade relations, a lot of un, uh, uncertainties, etc. But it also Brexit also helps us to tell a very good story of why we actually have the European Union, why do we have EU institutions? Monsieur Barnier, he did an excellent job in just proving the case uh, that this is the only actor we have in the European Union that could have potentially of excellent job proving the Brits wrong, the Brexiteers wrong, that it's the EU institutions spoiling the entire show in Brussels. No, it's the EU institutions, was Barnier himself, who communicated in a very transparent manner with everyone inside the parliament, with the member states. And because of this, we stay together and we will bring to a very end. That's what I'm convinced of, the future is Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. It was, it was excellent to, to, to end on, on a positive note, but I think that there's been a, there's been a good, good deal of, of constructive and analytical criticism, so meaningful criticism in the in the course of this event, so I think it, it definitely served its purpose. Um, I want to thank the members of the parliament for, for coming in and joining us uh, today, and I definitely want to add uh, uh, thanks to, uh, to both uh, Michael and Juha, as well as institutionally to TEPSA and to FIA for this cooperation, uh, which hopefully is, is, is sign of things to come, and we can do maybe something similar in the future to to follow this file uh also thank for for the older participants and for for coming in today and uh, and providing very good questions unfortunately we were not able to put in quite all of them but uh, but they are all being noted and we will inform the both uh, the members and the and the experts of those questions and i i warmly uh, always encourage um everyone to be in touch with the MEPs offices, uh, you will find the contact information. If if you're not in other other places, then then via our office here in here in Helsinki. Uh, so thanks for everybody. Uh, I wish all of you a very nice week. And the European Parliament will be in session also this week, talking about very important issues. So so stay tuned on on European Parliament as well as with the what the MEP, member member states are doing on on European affairs this week. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, and have a good week, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye.